driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. That double-minded, I looked up that word, double-minded, and it's a person who vacillates in opinion or purpose. Constantly, and you know, you, you have all known, and maybe we have been at times, that double-minded man that has vacillated in our purpose or vacillated in our opinion, and, and we shouldn't be that way. But in verse 5, it says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. Can I tell you that verse 5 is not separated from the context of James chapter 1? So a lot of times we will talk about James 1, 5, 6, 7, almost as if it's a separate little topic of the Bible by itself. But what I'm going to tell you this morning is the way we're going to handle it this morning is we're in James chapter 1. And the point of James chapter 1 is being patient in tribulations and, and how they're going to be good for us and how we need to receive them with joy and all the things we talked about last week. And then it comes verse 5, if any of you lack wisdom. It's connected. It's the same topic. As you're going through and I'm going through these trials and tribulations, we need to go to God and ask Him for wisdom to get through these trials and tribulations and persecutions and, and hard times that we're going through. That's the context of it. It's not a separate topic. The point is to seek God's wisdom in difficult experiences, to draw near to Him in difficult times in your life. Don't stay away. Now, our natural, sinful, sinful, I'm going to say it one more time, sinful inclination is to stay away, to run away, to hide. That's our sinful inclination. Not to run to God, not to lean on the Holy Spirit for guidance through the Word of God, not to run to the Word of God, not to run to the church family for help and support, but our sinful inclination is to stay away from God, away from the Word, away from the Holy Spirit's leading, away from people who can help us and encourage us and build us up and get us through this difficult time. That's our sinful inclination. And it's, as much as we want to dress it up, it's sinful. Believe me, I stand here this morning in front of you knowing full well what it's like to run away from God, to run away from His Word, to run away from the people of God when I'm going through a tough time. Because that's my natural, sinful inclination. And I have done it. And then I had to, you know, take some lumps and then come to understand that that is not the way you do things. <laughs> that is not God's way. Don't stay away. Run to the Bible. The Holy Spirit. Your church family. That will help you through the difficult time. I am not saying, though, that it will make the difficult time all rosy and silky. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is when you run to God, you run to His Word, you depend on the Holy Spirit for His guidance, and you go to the people of God to help you, that will mean the difference between defeat and victory. Now, I want you to put on your listening ears. I do not want to be misunderstood. 
and I want you to really think about what I'm going to say in the next 10 minutes. Okay? This is how I view and understand Genesis chapter 3. Okay? And I think it is rightly divided. So let me, now that you got your thinking on, you got your voice box ready to participate in class, let me ask you a couple questions. Turn to John 1, 1 through 3. John 1, 1 through 3. And keep your place in Genesis chapter 3. John 1, 1 through 3 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Who is the Word? Jesus Christ, right? You're all shaking your heads yes. The Word is Jesus Christ. Who is the one in verse 2 that says, the same was in the beginning with God? Jesus Christ, right? So, you got verse 1, Jesus Christ is the Word. The Word is God. The Word is Jesus Christ. We're all in agreement, right? Come to verse 2, the same was in the beginning with God. The Word, Jesus Christ, was in the beginning with God. He was God. He is God. Come to verse 3, it says, all things were made by Him. Who's Him? Jesus. Jesus. And without Him, Jesus, was not anything made that was made. So, based on verse 3, I think we can safely say that there isn't anything that was made that was not made by Jesus. Everybody's in agreement? Yep, okay. You guys are doing really good this morning. So now, remember, General Electric Power Company, right? Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Go to Colossians chapter 1, or as Cheryl would say it, go everywhere, preach Christ. She's a little more spiritual than those electric guys. <laughs> General Electric Power Company. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. Everybody there? No. Come on, Rita, get with it. <laughs> Colossians 1, 16. Look at it with your eyes. Listen to it with your ears. It says, For by him, who's him? Jesus. Jesus, were all things created that are in heaven and that are in, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he, Jesus, is before all things, and by him all things consist. So we're all in agreement that Jesus created everything that there is in heaven, earth, visible, invisible, doesn't matter, and he holds it all together. Right? Okay, now that you have all that in your head as basic foundation, turn back to Genesis chapter 1. That's an easy one to flip to. Now here's what I want you to see. And I have a... This is a connected point. It's not just a rabbit trail, okay? It is a connected point to James chapter 1. Now you're in Genesis chapter 1. Go to verse 3. 
Verse 3 says, And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. Now, verse 3 says, And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. Who did we just cover in John and Colossians that said, All things were created by Him? Jesus, right? The Word of God. So you, that little phrase, and God said, is Jesus Christ in Genesis chapter 1. You cannot separate the two. You can't say it means something else. Because we just looked at John chapter 1 and Colossians. And it said, God, Jesus created everything, and by him all things consist. All things were created, invisible, visible, whatever. Everything was created by him. Well, now when you come to Genesis chapter 1, it says, and God said, there's the word of God. There is Jesus Christ expressed in, in Genesis chapter 1. The word of God created the light. In verse 9, and God said, let the waters. In verse 11, and God said, let the earth bring forth grass. In verse 14, it says, and God said, let there be lights in the firmament. And verse 20, and God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly. In verse 26, and God said, let us make man in our image. In verse 28, it says, and God said unto them. In verse 29, it says, and God said, in all those verses, in Genesis chapter 1, you have the Lord Jesus Christ expressed in creation in those three words, and God said. Now, you're in Genesis now, chapter 3, the beginning of trial, tribulation, pain, suffering, disease, death. Now, I want you to think about this. Genesis chapter 3, verse 8. And they, who's they? Adam and Eve, right? Adam and Eve. So Adam and Eve heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. My contention is the voice of the Lord God was walking. The Lord Jesus Christ came to the garden in the cool of the day. The Word of God, the voice of the Lord, walking. The Lord Jesus Christ himself coming to see Adam and Eve. Now that they, not a catastrophe happened. You see, the connection with verse 9 and the connection with what I was just talking about in the book of James, when the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, what was Adam and Eve's response? They hid themselves. Yeah. They didn't run to God. They ran away from God. They hid themselves from the only one that could help them. And we do the exact same thing. And what I think is so amazing and so interesting that it woke my eyelids this morning up instead of my coffee when I thought about this. Jesus Christ, the voice of God, 
the one that his voice spoke everything into existence came in Genesis 3 8 and he would be the lamb slain before the foundation of the world I, I, I mean are you just astounded as I am about that he the lamb slain before the foundation of the world this is the one that came. He's the only one that could make reconciliation for mankind to be able to bring mankind into that new heaven and new earth. John 1.14, which I'm sure you all know this verse, and the word was made flesh. Right? You go from Genesis chapter 3, verse 8, the voice of the Lord God coming to them. And then you come to John 1.14, the word was made flesh. This, this plan of salvation is implemented. The, the, the way to be reconciled to God and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. He is the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. He is the word of God. He is the voice of God. He is the one that would reconcile mankind through his blood back to God. And I just think it's such an amazing story. And our sin and their sin caused them and causes us to have the same response. We, we hide from God. We run away from God. We run away from the voice of God. We run away from the people that can help us, that God has given us. He's given us the church and the church family to help us and to encourage us in our struggles. And we, we, when we sin, or we're going through a tough time, even if it is our, of our own doing, we have a tendency to back away, to shy away. And it is a wrong response, even though it is our inclination. Why? Because we're sinful. Go back to Genesis. Keep saying Genesis. Go back to James chapter 1. So in talking about asking for wisdom, as we're going through these difficult times, whether they be self-inflicted or, or, you know, or not, whatever the case is, know that we need to run to God and know that we need to pray for wisdom and and be confident in the fact that verse 5 says if any of you lack wisdom we all lack wisdom let him ask of God that give it to all men liberally and abradeth not and it shall be given him God gives wisdom generously and graciously you see our inclination is to say why God why me why now and why this I don't want to go through this the text promises wisdom it does not promise an explanation So we gotta we gotta understand that we need to run to God we need to ask for wisdom God promises that he will liberally generously give it to us when we ask he doesn't promise you an explanation doesn't promise me an explanation but remember that scripture is the source of all wisdom the Holy Spirit will guide you pray in faith and he promises to give it generously but the promise of wisdom is not unconditional there is a condition 
He guarantees his generosity in giving wisdom to the one praying in faith. He will give to each and all with liberality and without discrimination. He gives generously and also graciously. Well, what's the hindrance to wisdom, to pray, praying for this wisdom? Well, verses 6 through 8. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. There's the condition to the promise, and that is God's response to the believer's prayer is based on his or her pursuit of wisdom without doubting and without questioning in unbelief. Nothing wavering. Let him ask in faith. Don't be double-minded. Don't be wavering in your opinion. James is not saying that you can't have questions. He's not saying you can't have questions. But our approach to God, we must approach God with the faith and confidence that he knows all. He controls all. He's in charge of all. He is wisdom. He is truth. He is knowledge. He's omniscient. He knows everything. He's omnipresent. He's, he's at the beginning and at the ending all at the same time. Why would we not run to that person? Why would we not ask that person to bathe us in wisdom? It's, it's, it's insanity to do it the other way. When we really realize who God is. Don't doubt. Ask in faith. Verse 9, let the brother of low degree, now this little section here, depending on the commentary you read, you could get a whole lot of different answers on what this means, okay? I'm, I'm going to give you where I landed, and it's very simple. It's not this big theological anything. This is, this is where I landed, and my saying is just keep it simple. <laughs> and this is my simple. This is, this is what my simple is. But the brother of low degree, so we realize that we're talking about a brother, okay? So a believer, so we'll start there. Rejoice in that he is exalted. <laughs> But the rich, in that he is made low, because as the flower of the grass he shall pass away. For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but, in, but it withereth the grass, and the flower thereof falleth, and the grace of the fashion of, of it perisheth. So also shall the rich man fade in his ways. Those of low degree in verse 9 are people in extreme poverty and need. And many of these believers who James would be talking about had fled from the persecution of the church in Jerusalem and they're on the run and they ha they don't have anything and maybe they had something but now they don't have it anymore because they're being persecuted and they, ra they ran and they now have very little. Yet James in verse 9 says they could rejoice. It literally means to boast or take pride in their exalted position. And you might ask yourself, but they're, they don't have anything. <laughs> they're on the run. They're being persecuted. They're, they don't have anything. Yeah. But they're going to take comfort in the fact that they have an exalted position. They are an heir with Jesus. They're a child of the king. They're exalted position. They have a sonship. That word exalted is made high. They have a high position. Even though they don't have, they don't have anything to hear. They might be on the run. They might be living in a tent. I don't know what all the situations were back then. But they could literally 
take comfort in, actually take pride in the fact that their position in Christ exalts them. Though they have nothing at the moment, they needed to be reminded of their high position in God as his child. Your child of the king. The lofty or exalted position of the humble brethren was their citizenship and sonship that was heavenly, not earthly. And they and we can rejoice in the tri that the trials of life do not affect their exalted position. They might be poor and on the run, yet they are children of the king, so we have an, an so we have an awesome inheritance. One day, your poverty and their poverty, whatever the cases we're going through, our adversity, our poverty will yield to plenty, our adversity will yield to prosperity, and in comparison with eternity, their desperate straits would similarly seem like a short span, the short span of grass or wildflowers. That should encourage us. Not dwelling on the circumstances around us right on the here and now, but to look forward at our exalted position and where we are going to be. This is but a moment. This is where we're living right now. It's going to pass. Now the rich... This is where a little bit of the discussion came in, in some of the people I was reading in the commentaries on. But this is my simpleness. Matthew Henry says, the rich, but in the rich that he's made low, because as the flower of the grass he shall pass away. Matthew Henry says, worldly wealth is a withering thing. Let him that is rich rejoice in the grace of God, which makes and keeps him humble, made low and in the trials and exercises which teach him to seek happiness in and from God, not from perishing enjoyments. That's kind of where I land with my explanation of this. If you're a child of God, you understand that you are not going to, whether you're rich and have you know, all the money <laughs> that one could ask, you understand that that is not where your trust is. That's not where your enjoyment is. That's not, it's, it's the fact that God's word says, you need to rejoice in the fact that you, as a child of God, can be made humble, low, not depending in your riches, because you see and understand as a child of God that that's going to pass away. That has no lasting benefit. But the fact that I can be humble before God and be thankful for the grace of God and not depend on my riches is where it's at. When your wealth is gone, death, calamity, persecution, you're on the same plane as the poor man. Rejoice that in the grace, that the grace of God that was extended to you, which you believe by faith, has taught you to be humble and made low, and to not trust in your riches that will soon pass away. Verse 12, and we're going to end at this point. There's a promise when you make it through this adversity, this, this patience working. Verse 12 says, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. When he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life. You see, the man or woman who faithfully endures, whose faith is genuine, is promised a reward, the crown of life. If you remember when we went, we spent a lot of time in Psalms chapter 1. And Psalms chapter 1 starts with what word? Daniel. Blessed. I knew he'd know that. <laughs> 
blessed is the man that, remember, walketh not in the way, way of the ungodly, the counsel. I wrote it down because I knew I was going to mess it up. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. That same word, blessed, blessed, there is the same word that James is using in verse 12. Blessed, happy. When you endure these trials, when you stay away from the scornful and the wicked and don't do things the way the world does that we covered for a very long time in Psalm chapter 1. Well, in the same way, happy are you. Remember, you're going to be like the tree planted by the waters, right? Now, it says, blessed, happy, We're going we're gonna to have joy when trials come. We're going we're gonna to be faithful and we're going to endure. And when we do, our faith is genuine. We endure. There's a promise of a reward. That happiness now, now, comes from a sense of fulfillment for faithfully enduring through the trial, including learning all that you can about what God wanted to accomplish through it. Because we are going to be ones that, when trials and afflictions come, we're going to run to God. We're going to depend on the Holy Spirit. We are going to gather to our friends and family who are believers to help us and encourage us and give us support. That's what we're going to do. And we're going to make it through the trials and the tribulations of life. And one day, one day, our feet are going to land in heaven. And it is all going to be worth it. It's all going to be worth it. Hmm. Yeah, it will be worth it all. When we see Jesus, life's trials will seem so small when we see Christ. Probably be a good song to sing in the morning service. Let's pray.